Welcome. Welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I am Jason Whitlock, your host. Happy Thursday to you and yours. It's almost the weekend. I'm excited. You're excited. We have a fantastic show uh, planned for you today. Robbie Starbuck is going to join us. If you haven't heard the name, you will be hearing the name. A lot of people have heard the name, but Robbie is a popular podcaster. He has a uh, host his own show, The Robbie Starbuck Show. He's a political activist. He lives right here outside of Nashville, Tennessee, uh, in Franklin, Tennessee. He's been tweeting and exposing some interesting information uh, and get, providing some pushback on some of the popular narratives as it relates to uh, the Nashville school shooting involving Audrey Hale. But Robbie's been over all over a lot of different issues. I wanted to, he keeps showing up on my Twitter timeline, even though I had previously not been following him, but I would always see his stuff over my Twitter feed. And today I was like, you know what? I need to start following this guy. And more importantly, I need to know more about him and what he's doing. And so we're going to start today's show with an interview of Robbie Starbuck. Delano Squires is going to join us in the second part of the show. Uh, before we get to Robbie, first thing I need to tell you guys, though, is hit the like button. Hit the notifications. Hit the subscribe. Make sure you're getting alerts. Uh, reminding you to be here at 6 p.m. Monday through Friday uh, for the debut of this show. That's very important as we continue to fight the algorithm. If you're listening over Apple or wherever on podcasts, hit that five-star review. Write a review. Doesn't have to be long. Could be long. Whatever. But write something telling us, giving us some feedback on this show. Hop in the comments. Uh, we have to continue the good fight and fight the tech forces aligned against us. Uh, what, but without further ado, uh, let's go out to Franklin, Tennessee, just around the corner from us right here in Nashville, uh, and engage with and learn about Robbie Starbuck. Robbie, welcome to Fearless. Uh, I have to say, my first impression is, you look a lot younger than what I was expecting. Uh, I, I love that young people are engaging in this fight and building their own platforms and podcasts and sources of information. Uh, you know, I, I, I was expecting someone, quite honestly, just off your Twitter feed, maybe in their 50s or whatever, but you look to be about 30 years old. Uh, give me and my audience, and I know that there may be a lot of Blaze subscribers that are very familiar with you. I have a little bit of a unique audience, and I want to know, give me a little bit about your background, where you came from, and why you got into political activism. Yeah, thank you, Jason. Um, don't let the looks fool you. It's because I'm Cuban. You know, Cubans, we look very young, but I do have gray hair. You can look. I've even got a 14-year-old daughter. I think that's, uh, I'm a little older than 30, but I, I'm glad that I look as young as I do, because when I'm in my 50s, 60s, I'll be looking hopefully like I'm in my 30s. <laughs> uh, but yes, yeah, so the quick background is, I was actually a director producer for some of the biggest stars in Hollywood, Oscar winning actors, actresses, some of the biggest music stars. And in 2015, I came out and I endorsed President Trump. And that did not go over well in LA. You know, when I owned a big production company, RSM, that had about 14 directors who directed music videos, commercials, film stuff all over the world. Um, and my company had a big deal with Paramount Pictures. And so, you know, it was kind of a shocker that somebody in my position that had gone from nothing to having this big career in Hollywood would come out and do this. And I refused when cancel culture wasn't a thing, I refused to be canceled when they tried to go after me for this. I mean, I had all these different executives, Robbie, it's not too late for you to go back and just say you didn't know he made these comments or these comments or these comments. And I was like, look, I, I'm I'm Latino. I'm, I'm Cuban. My family, they lived through communism. They lost everything they loved. They lost everything they worked for. So if I lose everything for speaking up in America, then that only reinforces to me that I'm speaking up at the right time, because that's the greatest regret so many Cubans had was not speaking up out of fear of losing friends or family or their business. 
And I wasn't going to have those same regrets. I'd rather lose everything and tell the truth. And so, you know, I already had somewhat of a following from being a big director and, you know, people who followed those celebrities and had a little bit of an ability to impart some wisdom, hopefully, on them. And when I started to do that, my following just kind of started to blow up. And, you know, uh, like you said, on social media across all platforms, we really built an amazing community of people to just be unabashedly spreading the truth. And I feel like that's probably the greatest weapon we have in this time is going out there and using the truth and saying it fearlessly. In fact, your show's called Fearless. It reminds me of my favorite quote, which is that truth is like a lion. You don't have to defend it. You just set it free, you let it loose, and it will defend itself. And that's kind of been the, what I've operated under throughout this entire past few years, ever since 2015, is, is just tell the truth, it's gonna defend itself. I knew you were Cuban, but I had no idea, and I apologize for having no idea that you had, had built this Hollywood career and had taken this type of bold risk, but being Cuban, it, it, it makes perfect sense. Uh, because you know what you're looking at in America, you know exactly what it signifies and means, where I think a lot of Americans uh, are, are taking our freedoms for granted and don't think they could ever go away. Uh, but, but clearly, your parents' life and perhaps yours as, as a younger person, you know intimately, like, America is showing all the same signs that these communist and Marxist countries, uh, you know, ha have been overrun and these freedoms that we're taking for granted will be taken away from us. Yeah, I put it this way to people. I was willing to set on fire, and I knew exactly what I was doing when I did it. I knew what would happen. I was willing to set a career and a company on fire where I made millions of dollars and give it all up to just tell the truth because of what a dangerous position we're in. I was willing to have my own family be on the other side of these leftist crazed lunatics calling, at the time my oldest daughter was much younger, but even at school she was being called racist because her dad supported President Trump and because I supported the immigration policies at our southern border. And I did those things for very practical reasons. You know, if my family was able to come legally from a communist country where they faced fear of death, then I think that people who are you know, quote unquote, economic migrants can wait in a proper line, do the right thing, do it legally, show that you're going to abide by our laws. I mean, it seems like you kind of start out on the wrong foot if you come here and the first thing you do is break a law. So, you know, I had very practical reasons for this, but it didn't matter to them. It didn't matter that I was Latino. It didn't matter at all. It mattered that, you know, I was breaking the narrative. And if anything, being Latino made it worse to them. It's like, oh, you're not allowed to step out of line. And you know that as somebody who's a strong black man who's not afraid to say his opinion, that whenever you step out of line from what they want, want you to say, it's even worse. I mean, they get even more angry about it. So, you know, <clears throat> if I was willing to do that and burn down that career, then we really are at a perilous point. And I think, honestly, what happened this week in Nashville, this shooting at Covenant School, it only highlights how extreme of a direction we're headed toward. And it reinforces to me that I did the right thing. And I, I, I honestly, I can say this to people. I get asked this a lot when I go do speaking events. They say, do you regret getting to pal around and direct and tell people what to do like Snoop Dogg and Natalie Portman and so on and so forth. I don't regret it at all. In fact, my only regret is that I did not do it sooner and even more boldly. And that's, that's the only regret I will ever have is that I didn't do it sooner. So much of what you're talking about mirrors my own story and, and like, you know, I, one of the, you know, obviously I'm a little heavier than you, you know, probably by three or four pounds. Uh, and I'm a little Not bit much. older than you, maybe by like 20 years. <laughs> but but uh, I had to get out of Los Angeles and, and left in 2020 and, and left a very uh, successful television career because I just couldn't take it. I couldn't live with myself. California just no longer made sense for me. Uh, on, on many different levels. And so did you immediately, were you living out in California and moved here to the Nashville area or how, how did you wind up here? So my wife from the South, she's from Texas. Um, she always hated California, which should be no surprise to people. Um, she absolutely hated it every year about a hundred times a year was Robbie, we need to make the plan, we need to go. And Tennessee had always been a place 
that my wife and I loved going to, just me and her and I had worked here previously, coming to shoot some stuff in Nashville, and we just fell in love with the area. Um, and so, you know, like you, except a little bit earlier, we lived in Calabasas, which I'm sure you're familiar with from Los Angeles, but for people who don't know and can kind of uh, understand from this short little snippet, uh, Calabasas is basically Kardashian land, and we literally lived in the community that the Kardashians live in. So we lived, in fact, a couple doors down from one of them. Um, and so that gives you an idea of the type of environment that we lived in. I mean, it was literally leftism or die. Like, you're not allowed to step out of the group think. Everything has to be exactly the way they think. And so it was especially, uh, you know, kind of like a nuclear bomb went off in that community when I went out on Fox and I did what I did. Um, but beyond that, you know, uh, Tennessee has just been the best home ever. In fact, I can ever. In fact, I can say it's the first time I felt like I was at home ever since I was a little kid. Because when I was a little kid in California, it was very different. I mean, you can probably attest, having been there when you were much younger, California was not like it is now, not even close. I mean, it's like a different country. It was freedom land in many ways. And it was this beautiful place full of opportunity and it no longer is. But you know what is like that now is Tennessee. And so we beat you by a little bit. We've been here about five years now, um, close to five years. And it's the best decision we have ever made for our family, for our kids, for our animals, for, for everything. I mean, there's not one iota of anything that I miss or that I reminisce about for California because it is truly turning into a communist state. And that's proven by, I don't know if you've seen this, they've got this new bill they're pushing forward on, and it's not just a small number of them. This is pushing towards something that is going to become law. And it is essentially state-sponsored kidnapping in California where they're saying that if your child wants to transition and you as a parent deny them the ability to start their sex change, that a school counselor can then turn over that kid to an LGBTQ safe home environment and take them from you. I mean, no discussion, no nothing. The state could just say, the kid told us the parent is not allowing a transition, we took them. Robbie, I, I've seen you on Tucker Carlson show and some other platforms. But I'm wondering, have you been watching Tucker the past couple of nights? Because I thought he framed up this Nashville issue and this transgender issue in a way that really hit home for me when he, he's been talking about for the last two nights that uh, these are two worldviews directly opposed to each other. The transgender, LGBTQ, the far left believe that man is God and that there is no God, and that they get to decide what you are and what, what you, that basically they're God. And those of us that are believers, uh, you know, we're idiots and, and uh, we're, we're stupid for thinking that our rights and powers and our identity comes from God. I, I just think Tucker's been doing an amazing job trying to explain to people what the stakes really are this is a spiritual battle that we're going on, and this transgender issue is right at the heart of it. Yeah, I saw just a little bit of it because um, they were playing a video. I went to D.C. with the uh, libs of TikTok, um, and we went to visit AOC's office, and they were doing a segment on that. So I watched, I and he that. talked about some of this, this stuff afterward. And what, what really strikes me, he's hitting the nail on the head. And so... This is very similar to me for the Soros issue um, with the DAs. It kind of upsets me a little bit with our larger party apparatus because I wrote an op-ed warning the party about Soros's plan with DAs about five years ago. I did the same thing five years ago in The Federalist, warning about how this was turning into a religion, and I laid it out with all of the tenets of a religion. They have their own form of tithing. They have their own form of public ritual. They have their own forms of sacrifice, many different things. And I tied them all together and warned that this is where we were going to end up. And sadly, this is where we are. And I'm warning again, what we saw happen this week in Nashville is not just a lone wolf deal. This is going to continue to happen as long as this ideology is being propped up and celebrated by the left. And celebrated is a very important part of this. They are not just being silent. They are celebrating it. And if you go on platforms like TikTok right now and you look at prominent left wing influencer accounts, they are not apologizing for this. They are actually sitting up there saying that the real victim is the killer, that, that that killer, in fact, was somebody who was being bullied by Christians their whole life. 
and that that's some kind of license to be able to do what she did, which we all know is just ridiculous. I've been a Christian for a very long time, and I have never once in church or from another member of my church ever heard them say they want to hurt transgender people, that they would like to do anything physically to harm a transgender person. The only things I have heard are expressions of love and hope that they're able to get it to a healthy place, okay? Now, do we oppose what's going on on a very religious level? Absolutely. It's not our job to deny our God, deny our religion in some sort of quest to make other people accept us. The acceptance of the left, the acceptance of the Democratic Party, the acceptance of the ruling regime and the media is not more valuable than the acceptance of God. And that's what they want us to believe is that it is more important because this is real life. And, and that's what you should really be valuing is the opinions of these oligarchs, essentially, that are running everything. And it couldn't be further from the truth. We understand as Christians that this is a war, not of flesh and blood, but of, of principalities. And that this is this is much deeper. This is a spiritual war and it's being waged against children for a reason. And if you look biblically at the significance of the fact that they're targeting kids, I mean, you don't get more biblical than that. Robbie, why do you think there's been a delay in releasing the manifesto that Audrey Hill wrote? Why, why are they holding it, keeping that away from us? You know, I think there's only one reason why they wouldn't hold back, and it's because inside it, it's going to essentially validate all of the concerns and assumptions that we've had on the right about how far this goes. And, you know, as somebody myself, me and my wife, um, if you don't know, we were very involved in the laws that got passed. So actually, I introduced something called the CPR Act about a year ago. Um, and I had, you know, activists all over Tennessee take this to their legislators demanding legislation. And I went to the principals, William Lambert and Jack Johnson, and made my case for why we need these things. And then we did the rally with Matt Walsh um, because my wife is actually the one who broke the Vanderbilt Pediatric Gender Clinic story and then gave it to Daily Wire and they blew it up even more. And we were able to get the attention on this that it deserved. And so functionally, you know, um, having had my wife testify at this and everything and us being there at every hearing and, you know, routers did a whole story saying essentially where the reason these bills <coughs> happened, it puts a target on us too where, you know, I'm wondering myself, are, are, are there reasons we need to up security and things like that? So I do think that it does a disservice to potential targets, not just myself or Matt Walsh, but even institutionally, you know, like we know that a certain mall was targeted and it sounds like it was Opry Mills. Um, they deserve to know. All potential targets deserve to be warned right now because they don't know credibly a thousand percent whether this person was acting alone, whether they may have had conversations with somebody who may also be dangerous. And I think it behooves them to give those warnings to everybody by releasing the manifesto so that people can make appropriate decisions when it comes to their own security and so that other places can be looking at possibly links to ideological behaviors or extremism that they need to be watchful for. And so I do think it's a it's really disappointing, especially given the fact that Metro Nashville PD, they did an amazing job. I mean, you could not have done a better job on the actual takedown of the shooter. OK, um, and that should actually scare people. You know why? because it was so good, there's nothing you could have improved upon, and it still took 15 minutes from phone call to execution of the killer. And in that case, it tells you everything you need to know. Yes, those officers saved lives. However, had there been somebody with the same bravery inside the building who had a gun, there may not have been any deaths. And that's why one of the things I'm advocating for now is that we ensure that we fund security for these schools with armed guards, okay? And I, I'm even talking about block grants for religious schools and everybody else, because people seem to think that Christian schools have all this money. They don't. In fact, many of them are living on a prayer. We need to make this available for all schools to protect all kids and ensure that we're also prioritizing reinforced doors, bulletproof windows on the lower floors of schools, and make sure we prevent as many of these tragedies as we can. And there's no question that those three things I just named will prevent tragedies. And if we get them done, you know, we're gonna save lives. We may not fix the problem for good, but it will slow this down. 
Well, I argued earlier this week that we should, as a society, make schools the safest place on earth. It, it seems like with the money we've sent to Ukraine, we could have, we could take that money and uh, apply it to school safety. I, I believe I looked it up. There's like a hundred thousand public schools and thirty thousand private schools I in America. I think high school and below, and and. All those schools, particularly in dense areas, should have four armed law enforcement people patrolling at all times, and we can pay for that. If we can finance a war in the Ukraine, surely to God we can finance protecting our kids at school. Th that, that's the solution, and, and I think as a Cuban-American or an American, I, I hate to even go there because I, I just want to be a, an American. I don't want to be a black American, but uh, I, I'm sure you understand the importance of the Second Amendment, and, and I'm trying to educate people in our audience that don't get it, that, that if you disarm the public, uh, they're going to come to your door and make you take the jab and make you do whatever <clears throat> the government decides. Whatever experimental vaccine that they want to put in, into you, they'll do that once they take the guns away from us because the gun is what stops them from going door to door. They don't want to deal with a human being on the other side of that door who is properly armed and knows what he's doing. I, I, I'm, I'm sure you understand the importance of the Second Amendment and, and, and that disarming us will produce worse consequences on the other side. While it, it may stop mass shootings, it will not stop mass government abuse and killing and the, the ruination of rights and freedoms that we've all taken for granted. granted. Well, here's the thing. Um, I fully, I'm a massive Second Amendment supporter. Um, I carry everywhere I go. Um, you'll, you'll never catch me not carrying because I, I believe that it's imperative that people who are well-trained be the protectors of their community and be available and ready at any time to protect innocent people. But beyond that, look at the numbers. Gun control actually doesn't do anything to stop or slow this. So I'm gonna give you something and I hope you fact check it. Um, I don't know if you edit the show afterwards, but you can fact check me somehow, I hope. Okay, so um, two facts that are critical for people to understand. The number one state in raw numbers of mass shootings in America over the past five years is California, and it's not even close. There's no state that is close, okay? That's in raw numbers. So now what's a Democrat gonna say? What are they gonna respond with? They're gonna say, well, what about per capita? Okay, look per capita. The number one state per capita for mass shootings in America is Delaware, which surprised me. OK, Delaware is another state entirely run by Democrats that has gun control laws. Now, what's number three? Number three is Illinois. OK, another state run entirely by Democrats. And they have all these problems with mass shootings. So I don't understand where even the, the functional idea when it comes to proof uh, wh where are we seeing this work in America? The truth is we're not Europe, okay? We have over 300 million guns in civilian hands. You're not putting that genie back in the bottle. I'm never giving my guns up no matter what law they pass. And I'm not alone. That's the majority of Americans who own guns. They're not gonna just turn them over. And so if that's the idea, people are really not functionally looking at what makes us different because those are the things you hear. You hear Sweden, you hear Australia, you know, England. And the truth is none of them ever had this number of guns to begin with. So yes, we are different, but guess what? It also saves American citizens from falling into the hands of a communist tyrant, because I guarantee you, history is our greatest teacher. Look at the countries where this happened, okay? Where they took the guns from citizens. What happened afterwards every single time? Not good things, okay? And when you look at a place like Cuba, what would have happened had the citizens been armed, had they had the Second Amendment, Cuba would not have fallen into a communist dictatorship, period. What should we make of, I saw you tweeting about this, I believe earlier today, or maybe late last night, uh, Jacob Chansley, QAnon shaman, is out of prison. That's a great thing. I, I saw some conflicting information. Was he let out early? Or I think I saw on your Twitter feed, maybe his lawyer says, nah, this is what 
I always told Jacob would, would happen. Uh, wh what should we make of, of, of Jacob being out of prison? Yeah, so it's interesting how I broke this story is actually what makes social media so amazing is, um, you know, this is actually followers just come to me and they send me stuff and they're like, hey, you need to look into this. You've got to be the person who breaks this. So I broke this story last night. And the truth is, it's kind of a it could go both ways, because according to sentencing guidelines, yes, he is actually being released early. Now, according to the way things work and the lawyers understand this, like his lawyer said, um, he always thought he would be released around this time um, from our understanding. And I did send a question to the lawyer about this. It sounds like he's being moved to sort of a transition home, like a halfway house. Um, either that or they have put him at his home, but he has rules attached to it. And he's going to have those rules for a little while until, um, you know, they end up just saying, hey, you're able to do your thing. However, one of the things that's going to be interesting now is he is available to do interviews now. There's nothing in, you know, with the judge's orders or anything along those lines that would prevent him from doing an interview now and telling his side of the story. His case, in terms of a legal sense, is done when it comes to, you know, sort of prison time and things like that, unless he does something to violate his probation. In the event he gives an interview, though, I think we may be able to find out certain things that are going to make this whole thing seem a little more absurd than we already see it. I mean, we've seen from Tucker's footage that there's clearly exonerating video and evidence that was not given to, to this man. And, you know, I think it's fair to say, like, Maybe maybe he shouldn't have dressed up as a shaman. Maybe that was a little weird. But guess what? This is America. You can dress up weird if you want to. Um, and so that's not criminal. In I'm terms wearing of this jacket right day. now. I mean, I, yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> we might we might get the fashion police to throw you in jail for for your uh, your jacket. We don't know. We'll see. Yeah. But, you know. Jacob, I think it's it's good news for for justice that he is getting out early because nobody should go to prison for being directed by law enforcement to enter a building that we fund with our tax dollars. It's ludicrous. OK, and I've been to the Capitol many times. Um, and, you know, if an officer tells you, hey, you can go here, any reasonable person is going to think, oh, I'm allowed to go here. And so I think that just from that standpoint alone, it's just such a great thing that Tucker got this footage out. And I have to give kudos to Kevin McCarthy. I was not always the biggest Kevin McCarthy fan. I thought he might he might waffle on some things and he might be a little weak, but he really has done a really great job on this, turning the footage over and a number of other things he's done. So I've been pleasantly surprised with him. I wasn't planning on asking you this and you may not have an answer. and and. You know, I I, I've ne I haven't asked Tucker Carlson this personally, but I, I've been a little surprised that there hasn't been more done with the tapes, the January 6th tapes. And it, it feels like it kind of got shut down to me when there's, I just think there's more meat on that bone. Does it feel that way to you that maybe there was some pressure placed on Fox News and Tucker Carlson and, 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 to make that story go away. Okay. So I haven't I haven't asked Tucker this um, or anybody on his team this. Um, to me, it seems like there is much more of a story to be told. And my suggestion from the very beginning, what I think would be amazing for citizen journalism and for the types of you know really great investigative, you know I call them like they're, they're little investigative journalists that we have all over social media. They love to investigate this stuff. We could go through that footage in 48 hours, all of it. And if they would just put it all on one server, one website with the ability to just go and scrub through footage, timestamps, you know, make your edits. It's kind of like we use a thing for my podcast where I can review all the episodes. I make notes on the time code and it's not incredibly difficult to do. It's something that could be set up very easily. We could have this whole thing solved and put together and have a beautiful reel of all of the things that have not been told very quickly. I'd say 48 hours. And so I think that's something that they should really do. Um, in fact, you know what? After today, I, I know some people in McCarthy's office. I, I'm going to make that request again directly to them. I really hope that they do that because I think that could help give people a sense of feeling like their government is being transparent and they have a role in it themselves where they can make a difference. Robbie, the last thing I'll ask you, I'll let you go, get on with the rest of your day. I saw that uh, you were tweeting about the WHO, uh, World Health, Health Organization, saying that uh, 17 years and younger no longer have to take the vaccine. Uh, the whole anti-vax crowd was actually correct. 
Absolutely right. The criminal syndicate, um, I feel they're a criminal syndicate. Uh, that's not you know, the expression of the blaze or anybody else. Uh, but I personally, I feel they're a criminal syndicate. Um, the World Health Organization has come out now and said, you know, anybody under 17, you don't have to get the vaccine. No big deal. You know, natural immunity is great. And my head about exploded because um, we've been saying this for years. I literally said it from the very beginning in 2020 when they announced that they were going to start warp speed. I said, I don't want any medicine made at warp speed, period. That's uh, something we've seen very clearly in the past has not been a smart thing to do to speed drugs through. And again, you know, you see the results here. You see what's happened with kids. It's irrefutable. And for them to just willy nilly just toss this out. Hey, yeah, actually, you know what? If you're under 17, no big deal. It's it's ludicrous. And honestly, everyone's owed an apology, a major apology. And what they should really be talking about and doing right now is figuring out a way to create a fund, which they could do very quickly for all of the vaccine injury victims and all of the people whose family members have died from cardiac issues associated with this vaccine. And that's what they should be doing is trying to clean up the mess that they made. But instead, they're still behaving like they're these oligarchs who are going to make all of our health decisions for us. So if anybody out there still trust these organizations, my plea to you is look at their record, look at our record, okay? From the very beginning, we were right about the masks, we were right about the vaccines, we were right about natural immunity, we were right about the schools, we were right about social distancing, we were right about all these things, and the WHO and the CDC every single time were wrong, and not only wrong, but they gaslit you. They gaslit you in the face of enormous evidence, they treated you like you were stupid. It is time for people to wake up Stop trusting these criminals and start using your own mind. Start doing research. Start looking at the actual science, and you will see very clearly that you should never trust these organizations again. And they're not just organizations. They are organized crime, in my opinion. And if you actually look into this, you research it, you will see for yourself that that's the case. And the big pharma companies are their best friends. They're all in this together. We saw this just now with Rand Paul, a good friend of mine, questioning the Moderna CEO, who will not will not acknowledge the science is proving that his vaccine has caused so many problems, will not acknowledge it still to this day, and will not acknowledge that members of our own government are getting paid by Moderna at the same time that Moderna is lobbying our government and doesn't know. He actually said he doesn't know if that's a conflict of interest. I think anybody with a brain can see these institutions and big pharmaceutical companies are conflicted in every possible way and that we've got, we've got to do something about it. We've got to stop this insanity. Robbie, I lied or I was inaccurate. I do have one more question that I have to ask. I apologize because it, it's very important because I want you to speak to what is it about Nashville? Because I'm so glad you took the time to educate me on Robbie Starbuck and all that you're doing here. Again, I've been loosely or uh, nonchalantly following you over social media. But when I think about you being here and coming here five years ago, when I think about the Daily Wire coming here and Matt Walsh being here, I, I don't I don't know if you know the rapper Bryson Gray did the Let's Go Brandon song yeah. or whatever. Yeah, I know Bryson. He's now here in the Nash. Yeah, he's now here in the Nashville area. For some reason, I chose to relocate here to Nashville. It feels like Nashville is ground zero uh, for this cultural war that we have going on, and it seems like this is our home base. The, the believers in God, conservatives, this is our home base here in Nashville, Tennessee. There's something special about Nashville. Do you feel the same way? I absolutely do. I've been saying and joking around for a long time that everybody's just following me here. But the truth is, um, we're all just following. We're following our hearts. We're following God. And there's a reason we're all being led here. And you can feel it. I mean, there is something incredibly special about Middle Tennessee and about our place in this movement, in the restoration of our country, in the revival of a country that really is a country that makes our forefathers proud and makes makes our faith proud, too. And I think that that's something that we can all feel and we understand the gravity of. And I almost say, you know what Nashville is? Nashville is the home of rebels with a cause, people willing to take a risk to risk everything for the things that they believe in. And that's a beautiful thing. And if you look at you know history and you think about the people who really matter, the people who make a difference, the people who really like they stick in your mind, 
they're rebels who had a cause. And I, I believe that's what's in our hearts, the people who have come here, is we have that cause and we're willing to go all the way. We're willing to lay it all on the line for the things we love and the people we love. Thank you, Robbie. Appreciate the time. Uh, I will be following up and following you over social media and watching your podcast. If there's anything I can ever do to help you or Jacob Chansley, if there's some way we can help him retransition back into the world, please let me know and I will be happy to lend support. Thank you so much. Uh, that is Robbie Starbuck. It was awesome to get for me to get to know his story. Perhaps some of you already knew his story, but you know, the last thing I talked with him about, that there's something happening here in Nashville. I, I, I just can't believe all the people that I keep running into that, when I first figured out that Bryson Gray would just live 30 minutes from Nashville, I was like, what? How, you know, I thought this dude was from North Carolina, from someplace else. And, and, and I've been, again, I've been nonchalantly following Robbie Starbucks' work, not fully grasping why he kept showing up on my timeline. It would always be interesting. But I didn't know until today that he lived here in Nashville. And it, it blew my mind. And when I think about the Daily Wire being here and Matt Walsh being here and Candace Owens being here now and, and just, just and us fearless being here. This is the Mecca for uh, trying to save this country. And, and, and I'm, I'm not saying this, this is coming organically. This isn't some prepared thing that, that I was, oh, this is gonna be the perfect segue into talking about roll call. It's coming to me organically about why I'm here, why we're doing roll call here, why this place is special, why I want you to come join us on April 15th. We're going to have worship, we're going to have great music, we're going to have great food, we're going to have a great time, and we're going to inspire each other, and we're going to remind each other that we have a responsibility as men to save this country and protect our children and women. And I mean that in the most sincerest way possible. The people, just like Robbie just said, I'm listening to this guy. I didn't know, and I'm sorry for not knowing, but I did not know this guy walked away from all that in Hollywood because of his beliefs. And I'm listening to his story, and I'm like, oh my God, this sounds like me. I didn't know, that, and he came here to Nashville, and he's laying it all on the line because he loves this country and he wants to leave a better society for his kids. I've shared with you all, all the time, everybody, I don't have kids. But th there's something about, and, and there's something about my own childhood that I just want every kid to experience. My childhood was awesome. It was hopeful. It was filled with you can do anything. And, and we're not giving that to kids right now. We're giving them a victim's mentality and, and a mentality that America is the worst place on the planet when we know that's just not factually true. We can tell it. I just saw a video earlier this morning, thousands of people running across our southern border. Thousands at one time running across, desperately running across our southern border. And they want you to believe that America's uh, the, the land of racism and perfected racism. And that, you know, then why are all these people of color running across our border to get in here? Why are people all over the globe breaking their backs to get in here? Why are Africans, black Africans, hoping they can punch their lottery ticket and live here in America? It's a lie. And, and those of us, and again, I'm not, those of you in Texas and any other, any other location in America that are fighting this fight, I, I get it, I support you. 
But there is something special going on here in Nashville. And, and one thing I, I you know, I, I've said it to other conservatives and people that uh, just want to be in this fight. Quit playing road games. That, that, that's the overwhelming feeling I have here in Nashville, as opposed to when I lived in California for 10 years and, and had a lot of success and made a lot of money and had some good times. But I was playing a road game. And, and, and anybody that's listening knows I'm not even that political. I'm just not. But out in California, it's like you had to declare, I hate Donald Trump and uh, Barack Obama is Jesus Christ reincarnated, or you were an outsider. That's how I felt when I would go out and socialize. Get in a conversation with somebody, and they'd start telling you and start feeling you out politically, and I'd be, well, you know, I really don't vote, and I don't like any of these politicians. What do you mean? You don't like the Obamas? Nah, they politicians, blah, blah, blah. What do you think about Trump? I don't know, he's just a politician. What do you mean, just a politician? Don't you know he's Adolf Hitler? And I'm just like. And then you gotta worry, like someone, for someone like me that would sit on TV and spout my opinions, you go out and you want, I think I'm gonna spit in my food because I'm Jason Whitlock and I don't play for the right political team based on my skin color. Am I gonna be mistreated over my, you know, tepid, ambivalent <laughs> political opinions? Am I an outsider because I actually love this country and think it's great? So I just got to, why keep playing a road game? Go play at home. And so when I, in Nashville, everywhere I go, my opinions, even among black people here in the South, they're not foreign. I believe in God. Most people in the South believe in God. And then once you get them in that God conversation, then you can start having the rest of the conversation. That, that, you know, maybe their politics don't match up with yours, but if you keep them talking about God and then keep pointing it like, no, nah, my opinions really ain't political, they're biblical. Now you got them on turf where they, they really have to deal with you as a person, as an image bearer of God. But any, what I'm saying, all of this is just to say, you need to be coming to Roll Call. Nashville is a special place. It's like coming to Mecca for this culture war that we're in. We, 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 this is, couldn't be any more important right now to let everybody know we're not backing down. We're not afraid. We're fearless. So go to fearlessarmyrollcall.com. We're getting close to capacity. So it is important to go now uh, because we're at Rocket Town. There's only so much space uh, and we're getting close to capacity. But there, there, and there's still a little bit of room at the cookout on Friday. Trust me, we're going to have a fun, good time. Uh, I, I'm going to give you a lot of time at that Friday cookout. We're going to do a show. I'm going to feed you. If you want a little something to drink, we're going to have that for you on Friday as well. I know that may irritate some of you other guys. So I'm not a big drinker. I don't think I've had a drink in three months. I said, it's probably, it's probably been three months. And again, that, that's not something new. I'm not on the wagon. It's just that I'm just not a big drinker. But if people want to have a drink or two on a Friday night, I'm going to provide it for them. Because we're going to have a good time and people are going to get to do them. They're going to do it responsibly. We're going to eat, talk. Engage, get to know each other even better. Go to fearlessarmyrollcall.com. All right, uh, Delano Squires, next. Atheists, the secular world, the culture uses our imperfection, our sins to take, shut up. You, you're, you can't stand on truth. And if all it was was imperfection, it eliminated us from standing on truth, this would be a very quiet place. I'm trying to be as loud as I can and as transparent as I can to try to inspire other men. We know you're imperfect, you know you're imperfect. God's grace and mercy, mercy gives you the right 
to stand on his truth and to speak that loudly into the culture, and we, we have to do that. You can look around and say, these guys have taken over everything. They own the CDC, the NIH, they got the president. Is transgender surgery for children? Colleges today are nothing but leftist indoctrination centers working fully against the Bible. What's the alternative? So you're gonna stop fighting today and you're gonna let the government raise your kids? And you're gonna turn around and let them chop off your 12-year-old daughter's breasts and let them sterilize your son and tell him that he's a girl? And you're gonna let them make the Bible hate speech? You're the last line of defense here because nobody else is gonna do it and God's gonna walk with you. This is literally worth dying for. Absolutely. I'm telling you, so it's like everybody, that's a nice little metaphor. This is it. If there's a hill to die on, this is it. The Overton window has been moved right in front of our children's bedrooms. And there are all types of people that are trying to climb up in the ladder. And every good father should be on his post so that when they peek their head up over the, the window sill, you kick the ladder back down, let them know, you, you move on to the other house because we're not playing that around here. Sometimes just standing up, just saying no, we're not going to do that. Not my marriage, not my kids, not my family, not my community, not my church, not my city. Just declaring that, that's victory enough. In prepping his disciples, he tells Peter, he's like, listen, Satan desires to sift you as wheat, but I've prayed for you. We're gonna face some ups and downs in life and we're not gonna always get it together. But if we stay on the path, if we stay chasing after, running after Jesus, running after his way, he's even praying for us. Now, I, I like it when you pray for me, Jason and TJ, I appreciate that, but <laughs> to have Jesus pray for me, that make me feel pretty good. When you make it through this sifting process, go back and strengthen your brothers. So we all have a responsibility as men. Once he's delivered me through this, I have a responsibility to go back and bring some other folk out. You do a roll call to just let people know you're not alone, be confident in your position, and we're gonna inspire you. We're gonna eat, fellowship, listen to some music. It's gonna be the first of many roll calls that we do. So we're looking for soldiers. We're gonna put on our best uh, recruiting pitches for soldiers. All right, welcome back. Uh, a little bit of a curveball thrown our way. We're not gonna circle to Delano. We're gonna circle back to Robbie Starbuck because as Robbie and I were talking, Dave Reed, my producer, who's on set with me, round of applause for Dave, uh, <laughs> uh, text me like, hey man, I think there's an insurrection going on at the Tennessee State Capitol not far from where I live. I live in downtown Nashville. And so I want to circle back to Robbie because this plays right into what we were talking about, how uh, Nashville and Tennessee is ground zero for this culture war. First, I want to play uh, some video uh, from what's gone on at the uh, state capitol here uh, this afternoon. Let, let's, let's play that video and then we'll circle to Robbie. <laughs> And so I've seen a, another video from the floor of the Capitol where it looked like a young man with a megaphone, black dude, is shouting about gun legislation and, and they, then people in the balcony chanting, no action, no peace, or something along those lines. Uh, it, it's a wild scene, but uh, Robbie, let's bring Robbie on camera. Robbie, I can tell you as a follower of all these insurrections, uh, I, I saw this over Twitter and it confirmed my thoughts that 
with a black kid at the heart of that uh, insurrection, it's not an insurrection, it's a protest. Uh, it's, it's been officially decided this is a mostly peaceful protest. Anytime someone black is involved with the taking over of a Capitol building, it's a protest, not an insurrection. What ha have you learned anything from your sources about what is going on at our state Capitol? I, I have. So you see the man on screen right now, you guys are playing video in the well. Um, so that's in the well of the legislature. This is where they do their work. And something people need to know about this, that is actually a representative. It's a Democrat representative. His name is Justin Jones. And here's what's very interesting about this. Justin was just elected in this last election. Previous to that, he was a very, and when I say very, I mean very far left organizer in Tennessee, okay? He organized protests. He was literally arrested for assault and various other things in these protests in the 2020, you know, BLM riots and those things uh, along those lines. This is a radical extremist that was elected to be a state representative, okay? So he has really, really close relationships with all of the super far left organizers. I'm talking the worst of the worst, okay? So the question needs to be asked now, was this coordinated between a state lawmaker and those people who are in these groups organizing this stuff to do this? And to me, on first glance, that appears to be what's going on because he went into the well and did this whole thing at the same time that they're going and storming those doors. That looks to me like coordinated stuff. And if it is, that's gonna need to be investigated. I will say this though, something I did learn, it is very possible that the Democrat reps who went in and took over the well will face expulsion. Very possible it's being discussed by other people right now. And to be perfectly honest with you, I mean, they broke house rules and it's something that, that really legitimately could happen and wouldn't shock me at all. And I think would be warranted if they're, if they're actually able to say, there was coordination here between this lawmaker and the organizers who, you know, really started pushing toward an insurrection. I mean, there's this is what they would call it if it was us. They'd say it's an insurrection. So, you know, you've got to look at this and say this is a little more concerning than it even looks on face value if a state lawmaker was that involved. A state lawmaker sounds like he actually did what they accused Donald Trump of doing. He actually provoked this. Do, do, do you, and obviously sure you know a like little that. bit about him, but uh, yeah, around what age set is this guy in? Is he 30 years old, 40 years old? And, and is there a certain district or area that he represents? He's in his 20s, and uh, I'm, I'm not recollecting right off the top of my head which part of Nashville he represents, but it's a certain part of Nashville. He's in his 20s. He is a radical. I mean, when I say he's very far left, I'm not just like, you know, doing political stuff. I'm being very, very genuine with this. He's extremely far left, okay? Um, this was one of those ringleaders of the craziest protests you saw. He was there at the worst events that we've seen as far as, you know, protests that got out of control, turned into riots and stuff like that. This is, this is not a good guy. Um, you know, he was arrested for a reason, and then we've got radical DAs in Nashville that refused and dropped the assault charges on him. But I think everybody understands what that deal is, what's going on there. Nobody even conceived that this person could win because they had such a disgusting record, and they ended up winning because that's how far left the Democrats have gone, and the district he represents is one that is very far left. And so it should come as no surprise at this point, this is the type of person we're going to see more of from Democrats winning primaries is people who are really leaning into that sort of like communist territory. And that's that's the kind of messaging I see from him, too, is it's very much the like revolutionary social justice driven. It, it's honestly very reminiscent of the, the stuff that Castro's regime pushed. When you say expulsion and I, it, it obviously means what you say, but that would be permanent expulsion that that they would you know, they'd be pushed out of those seats despite being elected there. It seems like that could get pretty messy uh, and end up probably in the legal system and the court lawsuits flying all directions. Seemed like that would probably be a bit of a process. It wouldn't be like next week, this guy's done, or maybe it is that simple. 
So in Tennessee, I'm going to have to look at this and I'm happy to come back and like go. I'm pretty astute at going through all the parliamentarian procedures and all that stuff and, and looking at, you know, the precedent and whatnot. I would say Tennessee tends to have a very strong constitution and the authorities of the highest ranking members is is pretty wide ranging. And so I wouldn't be shocked if expulsion is actually easier than it sounds in terms of, you know, sort of a quicker outcome. No doubt there'd be legal, you know, stuff that's got to be fought about it. But um, I do think that they'd probably come out the other side having that held up on a state level because, uh, you know, state legislatures have pretty wide authority over their members. I will say precedent wise, I would personally want to see that there was coordination of some kind, and then I would get on board with it. Um, I'm always very hesitant to overrule the will of the people in, you know, a country where we're supposed to democratically elect our representatives. However, I do understand the impulse to say, you know what, we've got to do something here to ensure this doesn't happen again. And if expulsion is the only option within the parliamentary procedures they have, then that would have to be the thing they do because you've got to get this guy off the floor if he's going to be inciting events like this, working with far left organizers to do this stuff and pose a threat to safety to other people. And if he's doing that from the inside, that that can get incredibly dangerous very fast. So it's, you know, I, I get some trepidation to to going and doing it, but at the same time, you, you can't allow this stuff to continue. And I do think that a strong reaction is warranted to ensure that this does not become a norm because we need to have law and order and we've got to be able to know that our state house, our state representatives can do their work without fear that they're going to be facing down violence from protesters who are really in our state. This is the this is the small minority. They're very loud. They're very angry. They clearly are leaning toward uh, violent rhetoric and violent behaviors, but they are the, the minority. And to allow them to essentially take over the Capitol and try to bully representatives or scare them into doing something different than what they would do, what they were elected to do. I just think, you know, we've got to be very careful with allowing that. Hey, uh, just to buttress your point about this being coordinated, we got to remember just yesterday in Kentucky, they were protesting inside the House. And so there seems to be a movement in Kentucky borders the state of Tennessee. Uh, for those of you not familiar with <laughs> geography, uh, and then I, I did look up uh, Justin Jones just to put some details on some of the stuff uh, Robbie has told us. He's an American act. This is just straight off Wikipedia. American activist and politician from the state of Tennessee. He is the member of the Tennessee House of Representatives for District 52. Uh, Jones earned a Bachelor's of Arts from Fisk, enrolled at Vanderbilt Divinity School, so he's got a religious background. Well, well, uh, divinity in quotation marks when it comes to Vanderbilt University and their divinity program. Got you. I'm in agreement uh, on so that. So he's got a degree, <laughs> yeah, from, from the Alphabet Religious School at Vanderbilt, he has a degree. Uh, he was arrested for refusing to leave a rally held by Marsha Blackburn in October 2018 and 2000. 19, he campaigned for removal of the bus of, of Nathan Bedford Forrest from the Tennessee State Capitol. He was charged with assaulting uh, Glenn Casada? Casada. Casada, a member of the Tennessee it's House of Representatives, by allegedly throwing a drink at him. Casada later uh, agreed to drop the charges. In 2020, Jones organized a 62 day sit in protest for racial justice outside the state capitol after the murder of George Floyd. He was arrested and faced 14 charges, which were dropped uh, in 2019, announced his candidacy for anyway. Yeah, this guy's got, you know anything else about him, Dave? Or? Uh, so I thought Robbie was being very generous when he referred to him as a political activist. He's a political agitator. And everything that yes. you read there is where he first popped on the scene. It was the arrest at the, Mar uh, the Marshall Blackburn event that got him notoriety. He also was uh, leading some of the protests in wake of the Waffle House shooting. Uh, so this is a guy who has been an agitator in the Nashville area for s quite some time. And there was a moment in the Capitol earlier where they asked the media to leave. So I think there they may have gotten wind that something was going down and this was going to be a coordinated effort between these three legislatures who were on the floor, these three representatives who were on the floor and members of the public who were outside protesting. Because this first came across uh, about eight o'clock this morning, I saw one of the news channels here in town, News Channel 5, uh, tweet out videos saying that there were hundreds of parents 
moving on the state capitol to protest uh, what happened at Covenant School and the shooting and call for stricter gun laws. Well, if you look at that crowd, those aren't parents. Those are young people. And I guarantee if you go downtown around the state capitol and look at the license plates, there's a lot of out-of-state license plates around that because this has always been the, the MO for the protests that have gone on at the state capitol in Nashville. It's not, like Robbie said, it's not the local people. It's not Middle Tennesseans. It's not people born and raised here. There's been a large contingency of outside people who have come in over the years when protests are taking place, whether it's an abortion protest or even back in the day where we were debating state income tax in Tennessee. This has been going on for a very long time. People would come in from out of state to advocate for a state income tax in the state of Tennessee. So and this is one of the guys who, in the course of the past 10 years, has been a thorn in the side of his community. And the district that he represents is uh, the 52nd district. It's the district that basically, the way it was constructed, basically kept John Cooper, the mayor's brother, in Washington for about 40 years because it's just one of those districts that is so heavily left, heavily dem Democrat run that they can pretty much override an entire uh, voting district with their, their power, their vote. Robbie, did you see the video yesterday of Jamal, is it Bowman or Cannon? I can't remember, the congressman from New York yeah, they got in the face or was yelling and screaming and and, and then he started, uh, I think, arguing with Massey. It, 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 this, yeah, th this video yesterday. And so it, it everything to me on the left is always coordinated. It, it, they got their talking points that they send out to everybody. I, I don't, at least as, a con as someone who's considered a conservative, I never get talking points. I, the, the, we seem less coordinated than they are. But I, I saw this video yesterday, or, or this morning, I can't remember when I saw it, and it's like, there, there's this whole get in your face movement. And, and now, and this guy out of New York who's in DC and you know, uh, working in Congress, and now connecting it to Justin, it's, it's like, our, this feels to me like the left is ready to push this across the line and like, let's get it on. Let's get it. Let's get ready to rumble. That's what it feels like to me. They're just getting more and more aggressive and, and want something to pop off. I think you're absolutely right. I talked to my wife about that this week. I, I feel a sea change is going on. And, and to just elaborate on what your producer said about Justin Jones, this is somebody who followed me around, followed me, like in my face, for a good 25 minutes just saying obscene things before he was elected to office trying to, to get into an argument with me on camera. And they're just electing lunatics. And this is what happens, what you saw with Jamal, is uh, Jamal Bowman, this is what they're gonna get more of, is people like this who are off their rockers, who are doing this for media attention. It's about power, it's about control, it's about fame for these people, and, and they desperately seek it. So I'm good buddies with Massey. Thomas Massey's an excellent representative, maybe the best in the House, one of the best at least. Um, and I just visited him last week in D.C. And this is a guy who's just, you know, he wants to actually find solutions. He's one of those people that's actually very genuine and in, in wanting to do his job. And it's why people love him so much. And so, and he meets with people from the other side on a regular basis, which a lot of members of Congress don't do. And so here's the thing that I found interesting about that, that whole thing that, that went on. It was very clear that Jamal Bowman had a little media setup going there for him to do political theater to fundraise off of. That's what he wanted to do, okay? Massey interrupted that by saying, hey, let's talk about this. Let's try to find something, you know, we, we can do. And, you know, in that process, wanted to talk to him about a bill that he's bringing up. And it's actually a very good bill. And instead of talking about it, they got into an argument. And I should say Bowman really started it. And Thomas was calm the entire time. But Thomas said something to him that Bowman couldn't deal with. And it was the fact 
that no school that has armed teachers has had a school shooting. No school with those armed teachers has had an accidental discharge. That's an uncomfortable fact for Jamal Bowman. When he told him that, that's where things really escalated. And this is what we're going to see more and more of. The left cannot debate the actual facts, so they have to just scream louder than you to try to get attention. And that's what we saw. And honestly, it, it, it got to a comical point, because if you watch this exchange and you watch it all the way through, he starts actually getting physical with him, too, and pushing him and putting his hands on him. And I thought, if Thomas Massey did this to AOC, he would be arrested for assault. But Jamal Bowman, this is like the media is like, oh, he's a hero. He's standing up for our children. When in reality, all he cares about is fundraising. Nothing he said was sense cool at all. He made zero sense, made zero points, just screamed and screamed and screamed. And the reality is this is why we have done nothing as a country to actually protect kids in school, because people like Jamal would rather go out there, have a little screaming hissy fit and then go fundraise off of it and then do it all over again in three months when we have another terrible shooting. I, 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 I just kind of, I feel like we're reaching a point of no return. I mean, if, if this is the way the game's going to be played, the, the, the guy going back to the, uh, here in Tennessee, the state, he brought a megaphone in to make sure he could shout over the top of everybody. I get, he probably watched Jamal and said, well, if Jamal had brought a megaphone, uh, Thomas and Matthew, <laughs> so let me bring a megaphone in. I, I'm, all of this just feels like they want war and conflict more than we do. The people who are the most vocal about violence are the ones trying to instigate the violence now. And I, there's a part of me that I, I guess the man in me wants to buck up and say, you don't want that smoke. That's like the, the, the transgender uh, day of vengeance and posting photos that, of yes. them with guns. You don't, you don't want to start that fight. Like if you really want to, to put the numbers up against each other, that's not a fight you want. But the sensible side of me says, we can't fall for this violence because that's what they want. They want us to react violently to what they're doing so they can say, look, this is who we, they, we, they are who we said they are. They are the monsters. They are the people who worship Donald Trump. They are, they can't control their emotions. And to go to the, the whole thing uh, with, with Bowman and, and Massey yesterday, when he tried to bring up the fact about the armed teachers, no school has ever been had a school shooting where there were teachers that were armed. Well, Bowman came back yelling that open carry leads to more gun violence. Open carry leads to more gun violence. That's not true. Gun violence leads to open carry laws. That's the, the, the laws here in Tennessee. Tennessee is a constitutional carry state. That's based on the violence, particularly in Memphis. The rise in violence sees more people wanting to, to execute their Second Amendment rights that's what that's why there's he has it completely backwards so Robbie because Dave brings up another thing that just pushes my narrative like they're looking for conflict why isn't every Democrat politician speaking out against a transgender day of a vengeance or whatever which is they're just the real world they want to use is violence, a transgender day of violence. Why isn't the media, I guess we know why the media is in league with them, but every Democratic politician should be forced to condemn this. Again, Trump has to condemn everything 20 times and it's still not enough. Uh, would you, condemn the Proud Boys, condemn the Nazis, condemn Adolf Hitler, condemn, you know, but, but they can have a transgender day of a vengeance and no one has to condemn it. That, that, that seems crazy to me. So to understand why Democrats don't have to go and denounce this, you've got to really work backwards and understand that. And I know you get this, but for people in the audience who don't, we're, we need to begin at institutional capture because we got to this place because all of our popular institutions, whether it be you know things like the FBI, Hollywood, the news, academia, they've all been captured by extreme radicals, not just blue dog Democrats, not just people who want a different tax rate, but by extreme radicals who want to usher in Marxism. Okay, these are people who are authoritarian in nature and they want to force 
far left policy. Once those were captured and they took those over, they then started to, you know, transfer this ideology to the next generation of kids to be essentially their child soldiers in pursuit of changing America's fabric. And that's what we're seeing play out. It's why things are ratcheting up. It's why things feel violent and you know, really unsteady. Even myself, I have to hire security for my kids and my wife when we go to public things because we've had too many crazy people. We've had blood soaked mail sent to us. We've had a crazy guy show up and bang on our house doors. This stuff is reaching a, a really dangerous place. And I said this to my wife last night, and I really hope I'm wrong. I really don't think things are going to change until somebody who is a prominent person is murdered by one of these radicals. And I think that that may wake some Democrats up to the fact that this is going to end up at their door as well if they don't start denouncing this and they don't stop this. And I really do think that the, the institutional capture by these people on the far left have put Democrat politicians who even disagree with this, the ones who are like, oh, this seems crazy, but won't say it. It's because they understand the paradigm of their entire party is now controlled by these radicals. And if they step out of line, they are going to be crushed. Look at how all of the media and popular institutions now treat somebody like Tulsi Gabbard for coming out and you know, standing against these things. They will eat you alive if you step out of line. And so that fear is the reason they haven't. But I think when someone's silent because of fear, the only thing that's gonna make them talk is an equal or greater amount of fear forcing them to talk. And so I think that when something bad happens to a prominent person on the right and they get the realization that, oh, you know what, this could actually happen in reverse if this continues, maybe that will start to change some of these people's minds. But unfortunately, I don't think this is going to stop or even slow down until something terrible like that happens. And I hope I'm wrong, I really do. But that feels like what we're headed toward. Robbie, thanks for granting us some more time and circling back to us. Really appreciate it. Owe you a big favor. Uh, thank you so much. You know, his his final point. I'm I'm thinking. Didn't Steve Scalise get shot? Or wasn't there, who? Dur, are you talking about during the congressional baseball, baseball game? game? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. But and, but didn't die. That but that that's to his point. It's going to take a, an absolute murder by the left before these things who's start to change. Who's the woman out in Arizona that got shot in the face? Uh, uh, she was she was a Democrat uh, politician. She was the one that was married yeah. to the astronaut. Yeah. Um, but let's not overlook the fact. It isn't uh, isn't Gabbard in town today? Yeah. Yeah. yeah she's yeah. in Nashville today. So let's not overlook the fact that this happened on the day that she happened to be in town in reaction to the Covenant School shooting. Yeah. She's been here, I think, for a couple of days. Tried to get her on the show today. Mm. And uh, but, you know, her schedule is is filled up or was filled up. I, I that to me speaks to to the collaboration and this being a, a planned event, the fact that she's in town and you mentioned it in the, in the first segment today with Robbie Nashville being ground zero and what he was describing about the left taking over the institutions. It was called the slow march through the institutions and the, the 60s movement, the hippie movement back in the day when they weren't successful, they had the ingenious plan of this is going to take more time than we thought to get to the end result. We need to take over these institutions. We need to be in the schools. We need to be the ones teaching the next generations. So this has been uh, uh, proliferating for 60 years now. Uh, now, so, And this is when you have places like Tennessee, places like Nashville, who are resisting the way other places in the country aren't, they see that that slow march through the institution, decades of indoctrinating the children and trying to infiltrate the next generation isn't working. So what is next for them? Apparently the answer to that is violence. Yeah, that, that is certainly the next step. I, I, only thing I would slap, their plan is working in, in terms of like, you know, we got school teachers hanging up pride flags everywhere. We, we as a believer, we've turned pride into some kind of virtue, mm -hmm. which just blows my mind. Everybody's running around talking about pride, pride, pride. And, and I was maybe it was Delano I was talking to this morning or last night where somebody just made the point to me is I can't remember. It doesn't matter who it was, but it's just like 
Anytime you have a flag, that means you're there for war and total capture. In, in terms of, you, you know, America has a flag. Yeah. The state of Tennessee has a flag. The, El, the alphabet, they have a flag. They're there for war. You know, they're there. This is like Game of Thrones, and they house, uh, I don't know, if I used to be able to say all the houses, House Stark or whatever. Yeah. The Alphabet Mafia has house alphabet and a flag, and they're planting it in schools and every place else. They're making the, the White House getting lit up in rainbow colors. I think everyone has a banner that they're willing to fight under. So when you see those things hang, hanging in a classroom, that is who they are. That, that is the one thing that dominates their life. Uh, as patriotic as I am, there's not an American flag on my house. But if you walk in, you're going to see a Bible on the table. Because that's who I'm willing to fight well, for. That's Dave, who I'm willing to die Dave, for. Dave, uh, look on the top of your head right now. Uh, there is a oh, flag. Yeah. There is, there is. <laughs> this may be, well, I can't say this is the, not the only one. It's also Sasquatch up there, too. So, I mean, let, let's be real about it. But I, I agree. There's, I have, you know, three Bibles at home and, and no flag, but I do have hats with flags on it and I got other things. And, and, and again, part of the other, the, and I'm off on just a tangent, but, I was debating about what to call this show years ago, and, and it was either going to be Fearless or it was going to be One Nation. Or, yeah, because that's what we got to get back to One Nation Under God. And, and you know, I, had a, I got this symbol and all this other stuff that I, I was into. It's because it's, it's, because of my sports connection, it would be a finger with an f- athlete or fan holding up the number one sign. And then there would be a wristband that said nation, one nation. It's a combination of sports and, you know, Amer- patriotism. And we got to get back to that. And so when a person made the point to me about the flag, I was like, yeah, the, the, the flag does exactly what you said. This is what I'm willing to die for. And, and America is, or, or I don't know if it is or was, but, but, it's something I was willing to die for. Mm-hmm. But they so changed America that, that I made the point, uh, there was there's a UFC fighter from Arkansas that's pretty popular and pretty patriotic, but he was talking about he's willing to defend Arkansas. Mm-hmm. He did not say America, he said Arkansas. And this was probably a year ago. And and I was sitting there going, oh, that, that's, a good, that's a great pivot point because people have, He's basically expressing, I don't know what America is. I know what Arkansas is, and that's how I kind of feel. I know what Tennessee is. I know what California is. I don't, I'm not dying for yeah. California. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so that kind of breaks up the whole America thing, and it just, I just, oh, man. And events like this are only going to further perpetuate that as well because, again, you you labeling Nashville as ground zero earlier this week doing that, it's playing out in front of us. And if they don't get the desired result from what happened today, what's the next step for them? I guess we'll find out Saturday on the day of transgender vengeance. Um, hmm. Interesting day. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Waiting for the countdown, coming off the breakdown, standing in line for freedom. Looking for a breakout, feeling like a standoff, nothing in life like freedom. Came like a fighter, striking like a ladder, making all this moves for freedom. I want freedom. No negotiation, my system, no relation, we all just want to have freedom. Sitting on the corner, never been alone, I'm breaking my back for freedom. Bless, we are living, get back, we are receiving, all receiving, we all want to be free. We want freedom. I just want, I want to be, I just want to be.